Um, I want to welcome Paige Felice today. Um, Paige is uh, one of our guest speakers. On the first Wednesday, we're going to do a special kind of an educational session for starters, and then we'll open it up for dialogue and random discussion about whatever you like, uh, including questions and answers related to the theme today. Um, uh, we're lucky to have Paige. Paige coordinates a statewide aquatic invasive species educational effort. And maybe she'll talk a little bit more about that. But um, she recently has co-written some fact sheets that we've, we've distributed in the Lake Lansing area and has, uh, prior to that, has written other articles related to protecting our uh, natural resources. And I'll let her maybe describe some of that and kind of add to this very brief introduction, let her, let her get started. So welcome Paige, welcome everybody here. So glad you could join us. <clears throat> when Paige is done, we're gonna maybe try a little bit of a mapping exercise with, with Cliff, um, identifying potential uh, greenscapes or ecological landscapes in the, in the area, if we have uh, the time and the interest and the technology. So take it away Paige, welcome. Great. Do you guys all see my screen? Look good? Awesome. Yeah, so thanks for that um, introduction. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Paige. Um, I'm a natural resources educator uh, with MSU Extension. And um, my office is based in Mason, um, but I'm cover statewide. Um, and I do all sorts of things regarding water. Um, currently, a lot of what I do is aquatic invasive species work. So um, either doing working with boaters, encouraging them to wash off their equipment, um, and working with organizations to talk to boaters about the importance of washing off their equipment. Um, and then I also coordinate um, a program looking at retailers and encouraging pet and garden retailers to inform their customers not to let go um, of aquatic plants and animals that aren't native. So I'm sure all of you have seen those, you know, those news articles that say we found 100 goldfish in X Lake. Um, and so my work is really to encourage people not to dump their stuff that they don't want. Um, and then in addition to those kind of two programs, I also kind of work broadly um, with water resources and um, do a variety of educational programs um, about landscaping and protecting water quality. Um, so that's what I was kind of asked to talk to you guys a little bit today. Um, super brief presentation, maybe 10 minutes, so I can't get into too many details, but um, hopefully it is a good morning wake up um, presentation for you. So um, yesterday I actually took a walk um, in my neighborhood. Uh, I live in Lansing um, and this is Bancroft Park, um, if any of you are familiar. And um, I don't know, I was just kind of absolutely amazed at the amount of wildlife that I saw in this super tiny overflow, you know, um, pond, essentially. I mean, it's half an acre and I saw, you know, two species of waterfowl. I saw a woodchuck. I saw turtles basking. Um, I heard tons of spring peepers, um, songbirds. I think I even saw a kingfisher. Um, I saw garter snakes mating in a ball. I mean, it was just like this incredible kind of wildlife experience in the depths of Lansing. Um, and it kind of just reminded me that, you know, our wetlands, our lakes, our rivers are really these like wildlife hubs. I mean, this is the place that these animals are going. Um, it's really the only place they can go, right? I mean, if you think about <clears throat> where I live, I mean, this is kind of a sanctuary. Um, so no, it just kind of reminded me of, of why I do my work um, and why it's so important that, you know, we protect water, even just flowing off of our yard, um, because, you know, what flows off my yard, I'm probably goes to Bancroft Park, honestly. And so, um, yeah, it was just kind of one of those inspirational moments um, that I thought I would share with you today. <laughs> um, unfortunately, most of us that tend to live by water, um, have yards that look like this perhaps. So this is, you know, a typical lake um, in Michigan where you see lots of mowed lawn that's perfectly kept. Um, we have sea walls that, you know, run all along the shoreline. Um, you see, you know, people mow their lawn right up to that seawall. You know, they want that perfect green grass, um, likely fertilized. 
um, and not a whole lot of diversity, right? So very kind of sterile um, landscapes. And so it was kind of unfortunate that, you know, we as humans really kind of go towards this sort of landscaping when we think of, especially landscaping near water. <clears throat> And unfortunately, these have devastating consequences for our wildlife. So, you know, if you're a frog, I mean, I don't want to hang out by that seawall. There's nowhere for me to go. Um, you know, we know that vegetation, lack of vegetation near water directly impacts our birds. Um, you know, birds like to feed on those insects that are emerging from the water. And if there's no place for those insects to land, um, you know, we see the repercussions in our, our songbird populations. And then of course, you know, vegetation, lack of vegetation also goes into our water. So a lot of people, a lot of what I work on is in the lake issues. And oftentimes people that live on lakes, they don't, they don't like those weeds, right? They want a nice sandy beach. Um, however, you know, not all aquatic plants are bad and sometimes they're really great spawning habitat for our fish. Um, and so, you know, all of these kind of actions add up when everyone collectively is doing them, right? And, you know, these kind of traditional landscaping, you know, pr practices really can have devastating consequences. So, you know, we see lots of erosion issues. Um, this is more common, you know, if you live near a waterway or even a wetland, you know, where you mow all the way up to where it gets wet. Um, yeah, that's not great. Um, you know, we know that our properties, sometimes we have lots of nutrients. So maybe you fertilize. Um, and so that can, you know, be a source of nutrients. Um, and cause algal blooms, such as that photo you see of the mallard. Um, also, our landscaping practices tend to increase runoff. You know, we like to mow really short. Um, we really like to have big houses, big driveways, um, lots of places for that water um, that doesn't really have anything to go, doesn't have anywhere to go other than runoff, right? Um, you know, ultimately increasing pollution and then creating those kind of sterile landscapes where, um, where we see less and less wildlife. And so the good news is, um, you know, there's a lot that we can do um, that can have really small impacts even just on our property. Um, and so, you know, some examples, you know, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, you know, include, you know, diverting stormwater um, just to a rain garden or even just to a rain barrel, right? So you can divert, put a little rain barrel at the end of your gutter, water your garden with it. I mean, I do that. Um, I only have one rain barrel, definitely can't handle my whole house, um, but I love it. And it makes me, it makes me feel at least a little bit better inside, right? Um, other things that, you know, people can do is of course, having, you know, natural native plants are really great, um, especially trees. Um, trees are, especially native trees are really wonderful um, for our songbirds. And of course, people who live near water, um, those seawalls are really detrimental um, to our wildlife. And so even if someone has a seawall, we really encourage, you know, creating at least a 20 foot buffer between your lawn and the waterway. I um, mean, that's the same true for wetlands as well. You know, you want to keep that, that grass a little bit higher um, and you want to, you know, you want to be able to give those organisms a place to live and be, right? If you're a frog, I don't want to get run over by a lawnmower. Um, so it's important to protect those boundaries. Um, and then another way, you know, to improve our landscapes is really to increase plant diversity. So I know, I think that's a little bit of what we're going to be talking about today on the call is about just native plants in general. Um, so I thought I would kind of show some of my favorite plants that, um, that I like to see near waterways. So burrito is one of my favorites. It kind of has these big balls, um, that are spiky swap milkweed. I actually have this growing in my yard. Um, along with Joe Pieweed, you know, we have blue flag iris, you can't deny that, right? And blazing star. And so, you know, there's lots of opportunities to grow native plants in yards, you know, even, I mean, I live in Lansing. Um, I have very heavy clay soil and all of these plants grow well here, but they also like to get their feet wet. You know, they would grow nicely um, in a wetter area. And, you know, the benefits of natives is really endless. You know, they hold soil in place. They help with erosion, which we know is an issue. Um, they can absorb runoff. Um, so they're great, you know, in a rain garden. Um, and they, you know, are really particularly wonderful for our wildlife. So, you know, our songbirds really like to have, eat the seeds. Our frogs really like to hang out under them because they, you know, attract those native, um, 
bugs. And then of course, um, they're, they don't take as much maintenance. So that's a huge benefit. And so like I mentioned earlier, a lot of my work really involves um, inland lakes and educating riparian owners about improving their property. Um, but I think this can also, you know, goes towards people who, you know, have property that, you know, is maybe a little bit of a wet area, such as Meridian Township that has lots of um, wetlands. And so we like to kind of divide properties into three zones when we think of it near water. So we have kind of the upland zones. That's where you would think of trees, um, bushes, that sort of thing. And then we have this transition zone. So this is where, you know, plants that really like to get their feet wet, but don't want to stay wet all the time would be. And this is that we sometimes call it a buffer. So this is like super important for our wildlife. So when we think of frogs and turtles, um, songbirds, you know, this is where this is very critical for them to have this sort of area. And then lastly, there's aquatic plants. So like your water lilies, um, your submerged plants that you can't see. Um, and so, you know, all of these kind of tiers of vegetation really help to stabilize shorelines and absorb nutrients, decrease pollution, um, and provide habitat. Um, and so, you know, it's just kind of important to think of landscapes as um, diverse, right? So there's ranges um, in the vegetation. And so if you'd like to learn more about just shorelines, plants that, you know, are, do really well near water, I would highly recommend checking out the Natural Shoreline Partnership website. Um, so this website is really geared towards people that live on water, but I find it still really beneficial to take a peek at. Um, they also have plant lists. So if you're interested in some native plants that, you know, grow well near water, um, it's just a really great resource. Um, so I'd recommend checking that out. They also have a kind of interactive activity where you can grade your shoreline. Um, again, that would mean that you have to live on a lake, but it's kind of interesting um, just to explore lots, again, lots of great resources. The second thing I'd like to draw your attention to is the um, MSU Extension Smart Gardening Program. Um, so smart gardening is really our campaign encouraging people to use earth-friendly kind of um, practices um, in their gardens. So um, smart gardening, we have a huge range of um, fact sheets and videos on landscaping environmentally in environmentally friendly ways. Um, we recently expanded to kind of focus on water. Um, so we created five new fact sheets um, and they are meant to, you're supposed to read them kind of, oh, I learned a little bit more about rain gardens. And then it's, it leads you um, to additional resources where you could actually install a rain garden. Um, so our new fact sheets include rain gardens, stormwater, so like how to deal with stormwater on your property, protecting frogs. Um, so I'm a big frog lover, so I wrote that one. <laughs> um, gardening into the water, and then lastly, shorelines. So, um, you know, these fact sheets are free. They're meant to be distributed, to be shared. So um, if any of these pique your interest, I would recommend checking out our website. And then lastly, if you're interested in kind of water, so lakes, streams, watersheds, I would just encourage you to check out um, MSU Extension's uh, program, uh, water catalog program that's interactive. So we offer tons of educational opportunities on these topics. Um, and this is kind of a, a really nice resource where you can learn about a, a little bit of everything that we do. Um, so I would just recommend checking it out if you're more interested. And yeah, with that, I'm happy to take any questions or continue on this conversation. Hopefully, Leroy, that's what you had in mind. <laughs> yeah, definitely up for, thanks for being up, for sticking around. Um, any questions or comments? Um, and if you wanna raise your hand, otherwise, if, if we've got a lot of people responding, just raise your hand and you'll come up next. Just keep an eye out for, uh, for hands raised. And if you wanna stop sharing your screen for a moment, and then maybe a little bit later, we'll do a little mapping exercise with Cliff. So feel free to share any questions you have. Barbara? Thanks. Um, that is my backyard in the background, but it's a couple years ago. Magnolia is not blooming yet, but um, you, might be able to see there's a pond back there and 
I've, uh, so I'm really interested in the transition zone and I'm going to say I've had a lot of issues with management. Um, things just get out of control and uh, whether it's, um, you know, the rushes, the, um, uh, uh, there's a Plantago that just, just took, oh, I mean, I, I've, I've introduced, uh, iris and I've got some water lilies. I've got a duckweed explosion in the pond that I'm having to manage every year. I don't do any fertilizing right near the pond, but um, I, I think you're, the resources you may, maybe there'll be something for a smallish, it's probably a quarter acre pond. Maybe there'll be something that can help me deal with the management, but um, just, just you know, it's not a community thing. It's all our responsibility. And I'm kind of overwhelmed with trying to get it to look nice, but also be a friendly habitat. There's always been lots of frogs and uh, I'd like it to be a good habitat for fish too. I've got a windmill that aerates the pond. Um, so it's not completely frozen over in the winter, but any other um, ideas or resources you can suggest? Yeah, so I mean, aquatic environments can, you know, look a little bit more wild. Um, one thing I would say is, I don't know regarding where you're purchasing plants, but some plants that we see sold um, kind of in the water garden world, you know, can be a little invasive. Um, and so I would just be really mindful of that, um, you know, try to stick with native as much as possible if you don't already do that. Um, that would be one thing. And then the other thing to think about is nutrients. So, you know, that duckweed, while it's not attractive, um, you know, is an aquatic plant, um, but sometimes aquatic plants kind of grow really lushly when they have lots of nutrients. Um, so I don't know if you, you know, necessarily mow right up to your pond, but, you know, even creating more of a little buffer, um, you know, and your, your buffer could look really attractive. It could look you know, check out the Shoreline Partnership website. We have lots of great examples of kind of landscaping ideas um, for near water. Um, but, you know, having having a buffer around it might, might help you considerably. Um, and, you know, a lot of at least submerged aquatic plants, um, you know, reproduce through like fragmentation typically. So if you like cut it in half, you get two new plants. So sometimes we see people will you know, dig out their pond, say they have um, even a native milfoil, and then they have tons more come back. And that's because of fragmentation. So you might just want to, you know, be mindful of the types of plants that you have if you're, if you're doing any in, you know, in your pond uh, management. Um, but yeah, those are my ideas. It's generally controlling, controlling nutrients. I would really check out that the Shoreline Partnership website for some design ideas because you might be able to even do more landscaping that makes it more attractive. And never release anything from your water garden into the wild. I do have to say that's my plug. So, you know, say you have a plant that's growing like crazy well in your pond, you're like, oh, I, I don't know, I want like Lansing to look like this. Yeah, that's a big no no. <laughs> so, nothing from trade should go in our waterways. Hopefully that was helpful. This is Ned Jackson. I wanted to comment on, so I live on Lake Lansing and you, you know, your photograph was uh, spot on except for a certain, you know, a couple of segments of the lake. Um, but another thing that you didn't mention is that um, letting native plants, especially reasonably tall ones grow. Um, so one of the things that happens with the Lake Lansing property owners people is that they uh, they say, okay, well, we don't like geese on our lawns. So now we have to have a geese control problem uh, or, uh, you know, approach where we're going to go out and I don't participate in it directly, but, but it's part of the activities that go on here, which is to go out and, you know, uh, gather the eggs and frankly destroy them as far as I know. I don't think they transplant them. Um, but if you just let rushes grow, the geese don't really like to climb up there because that's a, a place where they can be ambushed. Um, and so, you know, what people do instead is to string little strings along the edges or whatever, somehow sort of artificially try to discourage them. Anyway, I'm just saying that's an, 
you know, a negative byproduct of, of all these uh, lawns down to the edge. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's like our number one seller for why we encourage people to put in natural shorelines as we say, oh, do you have a goose problem? Here, put in some plants. You won't have that problem anymore. So yeah, I was, I was asked to only give a 10 minute presentation. So I couldn't include all of those fun facts. Um, but I do have a fun video to actually share that was made from Wisconsin Extension. Um, they did this kind of fun video of a goose that's talking about um, shorelines and how he enjoys the grassy lawn. So um, you guys, you guys can watch it after our uh, after our meeting today. But I'll I'll share the link. It's one of my favorites. Bill, did you have a question or a comment? No, I saw Kendra had her hand up though. Oh, sorry, I wasn't looking. Oh, I just wanted to say, Paige, you are fantastic. And uh, I love the presentation and I'm hoping that, um, you know, we can make a difference in, in our community, um, you know, educating folks on, you know, what to do most certainly with that 20 foot natural vegetation buffer or recreating that. So um, you're fantastic, loved it. Awesome, yeah, thanks. And yeah, I mean, we have extension has you know a variety of kind of educational products that you know we definitely are encouraging others to share. Um, so yeah, there's lots of outreach education is is what we do, and it is really important. I mean, just going for my walk yesterday, I was like, oh, it was so nice, you know, to see this immense amount of wildlife in a, a urban desert. It feels like I live in sometimes. So. Any other comments or, or questions before we kind of open it up? Um, obviously, I will also encourage people to comment if you have uh, thoughts related to Barbara's issue or or Ned's, uh, you're welcome to chime in as well. Okay. Paige is the sage on the stage today, but you can also chime in. Sarah? Thank you, Paige. I really appreciate that. And I appreciate the resources because I'm working and this relates to Barbara as well. I'm working in my neighborhood with a, a neighborhood pond that also is consumed by duckweed. And we're talking about doing a buffer zone and figuring that out for a wetland possibly. I mean, on the, on the state and local maps, it says it's a wetland, um, but it's, we don't know if it's retention, detention pond, all that kind of stuff. So we're learning. So I appreciate this. This I think will be helpful as we try to figure out what to do. So Barbara, I'm I'm right there with you, but it's our it's our neighborhood pond. It's not you know it's not a personal pond like yours is, but I I understand the the difficulty. So yeah, and, and that's like such a great opportunity to talk to your neighborhood about you know decreasing fertilizers and applying at accurate rates if you are going to fertilize and the value of native plants. I mean you know and the value of having a rain garden, you know, even just decreasing the amount of rain just coming from your house. It's pretty amazing um, if you calculate the amount of rain that can come off of a rooftop. So, you know, there's all sorts of kind of small things you could implement on a neighborhood wide scale and then, you know, and your pond at the same time. And I would imagine you would see a difference. So that's awesome. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you. I will say on a, on a note, because we've talked about it before here, that I talked to the association and, and I have I'm found a lot of support that we're going to do something um, that's going to try to go away from the chemicals. So I'm excited about that. One thing we talked about in that association meeting was the idea of need, possibly needing to dredge it. I don't know um, what anybody knows about that kind of thing, but anyway, we can talk more about that later. Anybody else have any uh, comments? I do. I just wanted to say um, uh, we planted 327 native plants and have a rain garden and um, uh, uh, Vern Stevens, um, his group helped us along with Amy Heilman, um, but Amy's over in Grand Rapids area. Um, but around here, um, she created a website called the Native Plant Guild. 
So um, Barbara or Sarah, um, if you're looking for folks to consult with, in addition to pages resources, you might want to consider them. So it's the nativeplantguild.com. Awesome. Thank you. I don't know if you can type that or or your assistant there can help can type that uh, into the uh, chat window. But um, yeah, this is a great place to share share resources. Um, I know Cliff's got a lot of resources on mywatersheds.org. I don't know how closely you guys work together. Probably, I think Cliff, you mentioned Paige. Um, one of the reasons you're here today. So thank you for your networking. Anything else? Is, and again, we can kind of open it up. And if, if, if Cliff is willing, we might just do a little bit of mapping. One of our hopes is to get local examples of, of things that are working in our community so that uh, we can learn from people like Kendra or Sarah. John, you have some native landscaping in your yard. And, um, anyway, um, so highlighting these, some of these on a, on a map that can be shared um, is something that we'd like to do at some point. Have, you, have any other communities done that page that you know of? Um, not that I'm, I know of, but I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's out there. Um, I think it's exciting. I'm excited to see Cliff's uh, ideas for mapping. So. You guys I don't really to... have the whole lot of ideas for this. I just told Leroy I could help him uh, navigate the Google Maps thing. So I think Leroy's still kind of leading this. I'm just going to be doing the, the technical facilitation, right? Sure. Um, I can, uh, maybe I should start with just a, um, are you going to pull up the, the green map or should I, um, do you want to share your green map? Cliff sure, or a blank map. Um, and then we'll do this for a few minutes and, and then open it back up for conversation. We are recording, by the way, and so this recording will be available if you want to share with others later. Is the right screen? Is it my watersheds pulled up? Yeah. Can you guys look um, So, yeah, we did this just to give some activities for people um, to highlight some of the existing, you know, green stormwater infrastructure that exists in the region. Um, you know, we're a little limited by just the fact that it needed to be near public trails or thoroughways and all that stuff. Um, but it's kind of marketed as a bicycle tour of the area's green infrastructure. So there's this Google map and you can pull up, you know, in, in see pictures and information about it. Um, yeah, you can, and, you know, it, it just kind of mostly follows the river trail and goes through campus and stuff. It gets a little more uh, like sidewalk and, and bike lanes as you get downtown. But then not only is there this green infrastructure Google map, there is this printable map that you can take with you and it gives you a little more explanation. Um, so it, it's foldable, that's why it's all like upside down for some areas, you know, it's prints out as 11 by 17, but then it prints out into a little pocket or it folds up into a little pocket size thing. But it's describing what each type of, you know, category of infrastructure is, some examples, and then, um, you know, the, the directions, not, for, not really the directions, but the map and, um, you know, the, the key here, but it really works best accompanying that Google map. And so I think this was kind of an inspiration for Meridian Township. Roy reached out to me maybe a year and a half, two years ago, about doing something similar for the township, um, but not necessarily a bike tour, but just using this custom Google map to create some, uh, you know, highlighted areas of green features in the township, not just rain gardens and bioretention and porous pavement, but butterfly habitat, pollinator gardens, and anything that would kind of be deemed green. And just so people would um, you know, be able to see for themselves what this stuff looks like. And that's, that was mainly the intent. Um, you know, people are interested in rain gardens, but don't really know what they are, don't know what they look like. 
people may be interested in, you know, if they're redoing their driveway and are curious about porous pavers or permeable pavement or, uh, you know, turf pavers, you know, there's all these alternatives are, that are out there, but there's not a whole lot of examples in neighborhoods. And, um, you know, it's not like your neighbor likely has one of these that you can just go say, oh, you know, it, oh, it looks, this is what it looks like. You know, there's not a whole lot of examples like that. So that was kind of the, the reasoning for this exercise and for what Meridian did just to give the residents um, a resource to see for themselves what this stuff is. And so I think what Leroy wanted to do today was get your feedback on where some of these native landscapes exist, you know, either if it's your own house or somebody else's, and then we could put them on a map to start generating more of that information. Is that right, Leroy? Yeah, that was the sure. thought. It wasn't necessarily my idea, but um, yeah, learning from each other, um, sharing examples, um, and just beginning to brainstorm where are some of these things taking place that Paige is recommending and that some of you have been talking about for the last year or so. Um, and this may be short, but um, I don't know if we can actually do some mapping now, but we can at least maybe start by, if you'd like to suggest a uh, address or a location. Um, and I'll stop talking. Is the roundabout at Bertram on there? I don't There's know nothing on this map. I know Meridian has their own map, and I think that's located. That, that oh, is that is, over there? Okay. Yeah. And okay. Leroy, was this more focused on? you know, residents rather than the more public rain garden? Um, yeah, but uh, we're just brainstorming right now. So, and part of it is demonstrating this tool. So if you wanna just add that to this map, um, I don't know how easy it is to navigate to Park Lake and Bircham, but um, let's just go ahead and click it and add it. What's the name of um, it? Hidden River, Hidden River Rain Garden. AKA Roundabout at Bircham and Park Lake. <laughs> In fact, um, interestingly, Paige did an article on this back when she worked with the, um, an East Lansing news organization. And that's where I first met Paige. I don't know if we can share that page, but uh, that was a, uh, I thought you did a great job just trying to synthesize a lot of miscellaneous information. Yeah, I can see if I can find it. Um, yeah, so I used to do um, some environmental reporting for East Lansing Info. So yeah, that was a few years ago, but I'm sure it's still up on their website. I'll see if I can find it. Roy? Yeah? I just had a, a suggestion. I mean, this is close to where my property is here, um, but there's it's public really uh, just a little bit south of, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, a little bit north of where the property is here. And there's that um, bike path that goes across uh, Okemos Road um, down by where the uh, con consumer energy substation is. And that both going to the west and going to the east there's a lot of uh, wetland and um, uh, rain. Uh, I don't know, I, I guess it's a lot of wetland in there. Um, and I think even going all the way to, uh, to Marsh Road from Okemos Road, there is a, a substantial amount of uh, wetland and, and water areas in there. Um, and then when you go west uh, um, on the bike path, uh, toward actually toward Bertram in that direction, there's also a considerable amount, and I've seen flocks of birds in there, and I, I think those areas would be ones that might be worth uh, including on any mapping that you would do. I do have on the back of the property um, here, uh, it goes into what I'm, I'm certain is a, a bit of wetland, 
Um, it's not water. There is, it's dredged a little bit, I think, by the Drain Commission to take water off of that area. Um, and, and actually, I, I have to say that um, what I'm learning in sitting in on these meetings uh, does apply to the property that I have in terms of the 20 foot setback and just some of the things, these things all have to, and I think this has been mentioned, all have to be done gradually over time, unless you just have a whole bundle of money that you just you know, can't figure out what else to do with. Um, but, uh, but it is very educational and valuable for us here to uh, see what, what we can do and uh, gradually be able to move in, in a better direction um, uh, with how close we are to this wetland. Is it easy to put a line on your map, Cliff? I think so. Um, what um, you see those? Where exactly do you want that? You see where Bircham kind of starts to curve near those ponds. Yeah, there's almost a green line by Wild Blossom. Yep. Just that follow inter, that that bike line. That that's, that's the bike trail. Yeah, that yeah, inter urban. Inter urban. That's, yeah. Yep. Um, so you can add lines or dots, and um, we're just brainstorming right here, but. Um, by the way, Paige, um, John did a nice jingle on picking up the poop. So uh, you'll have to, John, you'll have to share that with Paige later, but um, uh, Paige might find some other resources around the state where people would like to share that. We're talking about funny videos and jingles. Yeah, it's helpful. We, um, I teach an online class about inland lakes and every year we, we share this, a goose video and a, Larry the bullfrog video about keeping shorelines natural. And every year we get a comment that says that that's someone's favorite part of the class. So yeah, little jingle videos make a difference. This right now is just audio, but it can be converted into um, uh, an MP4, which gives it the video as well. And I'm hoping to be able to do something with some new software that I have that will allow for, I think Paige is what you were mentioning where you have the geese speaking. In this case, it would be the dogs um, speaking. And, uh, but that, it just takes a little time to put that together. But, but it is available in audio form. And I think that I have, what was your, um, your email I, I, address again? I can is, get that to you, Paige, or maybe she can put that in the chat. Uh, before I we saw leave it this on the screen. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I saw it on the screen briefly and then it sort of went away and something else came up. But yeah, if you can share that with me, that would be great. Thanks, Laura. Any other addresses we want to add to this little mini map here that we're making this morning? I'm a little conflicted about um, just sort of throwing people's private properties into the discussion without sort of talking with them. But for example, Art Cameron, who was, you know, uh, one of MSU's horticulturalists, he's I guess officially retired now, but he lives just up the street from us and his gardens are absolutely gorgeous. And uh, essentially, as far as I know, it's all native. Um, he lives on Reynolds Road, um, but it's just some, you know, it's a person's house and their gardens that, that are uh, on both sides of the road. Um, but I wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't wanna have a crowd come by and sort of be standing around and gawking if you were riding a bicycle and stop to appreciate what you were seeing, that'd be all right, I suppose. That's a good point, you're Ned. You're, you're frozen? Um, not my Zoom, but my, my map. Okay. Um, well, maybe, um, maybe Art is responding here by freezing up your screen. No, um, that's a good point. Um, have you had any, um, has that come up with other mapping that uh, you've done, Cliff, or anyone else? I, obviously- The only one I've done is that that bike tour, and it was all focused on publicly owned and accessible stuff. So I did like MSUs, you know, rain gardens, the stuff at like recycling center where it's forest pavement, um, like the Michigan Avenue rain gardens. Um, mm -hmm. about, it, and a lot of it was focused on like natural areas too. So like there's some swamp oaks that are like 200 years old on campus and those are good stormwater trees, a big canopy. So highlighting that. 
similar at Moore's River Park. There's some old, I think, swamp oaks, if I remember right. So yeah, it was all publicly accessible stuff. That's the only thing I've done with, mm -hmm. with this. Well, I imagine we'd want to get the owner permission if we if, if we officially publish a map. But I, I like the idea of brainstorming right now. And um, Art's place certainly comes to mind as a good one. We want to check and see if he's willing to be to talk about it. You want me to put a pin on that? Um, I, why not for right now? We're not. It's not like we're going public with this at this point. Um, I don't actually know the house number. I just know where the house is. <laughs> Uh, but it's a uh, whatever it's where is it uh it's on reynolds road it's on the north northwest side of lake lansing um you can see uh a little further yeah, up can, north yeah it's, it's uh i think it's right where i'm having trouble seeing it what is it uh reynolds I think it's uh, where, perry right where perry Cove, no, no, no. The other side. That's over uh, to the left in this picture. I think it's where Co comes in. Randall. No. Randall's. Go down to the left. There's two parts of Reynolds Road. Yeah, I think it's right there at the intersection with Co. Okay. Co or Row. Oh, sorry. Uh, whatever the second one down from Mac is. <laughs> Lee. Our, uh, yeah, oh, Row. Lee. Row. My eyes are going bad. Row or Lee. My Lee. Yeah. Okay. I'm pretty sure it's there. Okay. Cool. Um, I'm I'm guessing that Kendra has thought about this too. This um, privacy issue. Um, Kendra, how do you feel about sharing your location? Or do you have well, any in, insights that might be helpful as we think about sure, a map? Sure. Yeah. So I think um, I would say I'm not comfortable doing it in a recorded session. Um, Right, right now, but I think um, certainly putting my property, our property on, on that. Um, but I think it's, you know, as we talk to neighbors um, more about things and they're willing to put their property on there, I think that we can talk about um, that more. So I think getting consent, I think we have to think about getting consent maybe um, yeah. in that sort of way. And then also, but, you know, but, you know, Emma's been talking about, you know, different parks and doing, you know, native landscaping. And I know on Lake Lansing South, you know, at the entrance of that park, um, meaning when you're starting to walk toward the lake, um, you know, there's some native plants there. So if we can look at what we've got going on in some of the areas around here, and then we can get consent from, um, you know, property owners, I think that will be the way to go about doing it. And then we can do some sort of blitz about it and give people accolades that they want to be really noticed or not. I don't, I'm not super interested in being noticed. I'm willing to show the property to some degree, but yep. just the backyard. Sounds good. Well, Cliff, thank you for helping this. And um, this is partly to demonstrate um, some of these tools to show, but show off your existing green map. Um, and then I, I will briefly share the green map that we started. Um, in Meridian, um, which includes some of these things we've started to talk about. And I'll, I'll put the link in the, in the window too, if you want to explore some specific locations. Um, you know, one thought with Leroy though, is really about like, and this talks a little bit about what maybe Bill was kind of referring to the other week. Um, you know, if we can highlight businesses who are doing this and give them some accolades for that, yeah. You know, and I think that that would help get more folks buy in to do that stuff and get more attention to them. One thing that MGRO tried to do last year and COVID derailed, uh, we had applied for, so MGRO is the Middle Grand River Organization of Watersheds. Paige is a uh, former board member of that and still heavily involved. Um, but we had applied for a consumer's energy grant for a variety of things, including a lot of water trail signage and wayfinding and stuff like that. But part of it was creating a similar program to what I believe came out of the Clinton River Watershed Council, which is a river safe, lake safe program. And so that was focusing on businesses and, you know, like giving them some best management practices to follow. And if they made certain commitments, they get a plaque, they get hanging their, their window or something like that. Um, and also neighbors with native landscapes, they could get one of these plaques too. 
And it was a successful program or is a successful program in Southeast Michigan. And we had heard that we were like through the grapevine that we got the grant and then COVID hit and they canceled the grant opportunity and started dump dumping that money into COVID relief instead. Um, so that didn't go anywhere, but yeah, there's, there's interest and, um, you know, at least from Embro to make a push on something like you described, Kendra, you know, kind of giving these businesses something to hang their hat on or like make note of and list them and, and highlight their willingness to. That's a great river idea. Safe, lake safe. That could be a way to resurrect our green uh, business, Green Star program here locally with businesses that were recycling, but maybe they're doing some creative landscaping things as well. Excellent idea, Kendra. Um, I just got an email about mosquito um, insecticide use. Um, any thoughts about that? I mean, just pretty popular here in Meridian. Paige or anyone else who wants to, to buzz in here? I, I don't have any, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Paige. I was just going to say, don't, excuse me, I don't really have anything to add. I know um, it's a common practice, you know, throughout throughout the country. So, I in my my background is definitely not not in that. So, well, I can say we have tree swallows hopefully moving in that will come and eat the mosquitoes. Um, and I can say, you know, in, you know, we have a ton of birds here, and um, you know, the natural um, predators will eat the mosquitoes if you don't fertilize. Um, so, you know, let's in, work on encouraging that and educating people a little bit differently about that. I would say this, we live, a wetland is on our property and we don't have a mosquito problem. That, you know, people come to our house and say, oh, a mosquito farm, but it's not a problem because we don't treat anything. So it doesn't uh, manifest into some mosquito haven that we're nothing, there's no predators. So all the, the ecosystem just takes care of itself. Uh, but for people that do want to treat, there is garlic, I think, mm -hmm. mosquito treatment that you can use, just pure garlic that's not, you know, toxic and, and things. Thank you. Great. We are about 12 minutes out. We usually try and keep these to about an hour. But um, mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Cliff and Paige and everybody for chiming in. Um, what other uh, issues are on people's minds? really an issue. I just thought it was cool. Hey, we've talked about this here um, in previous meetings, but did you guys see that in Rio Town? There's one of those like home product soap and shampoo Windex type cleaner refill places opening up, like where you just bring any container and just they just like tear it and then uh, you charge you by weight. Like it's the Lance, they're you know, marketing themselves as Lansing's first low waste store um and i think it opened, they, apparently they've been operating out of a basement or something for a long time and now they have a brick and mortar that's opening up on saturday so just for those interested in that if you want to reduce your your plastic contribution it's called mm, i would recommend it. what's that John? i was just going to say i'd recommend it i uh, uh one of the actors that that i record over here her sister owns that business and she had sent me some information on it and I would recommend that people at least go and, and check it out and see whether they have products that would work for their own needs. Because I think it's a good direction to go in. I think they do delivery too. I think that was the business model prior to the, the brick and mortar. Um, and I think I saw, I was reading their website. I never heard of them until they made this big like splash with their ribbon cutting stuff. But um, I think they used to do deliveries three days a week and now they're going to do one. But yeah, you can go in and Seems cool. What's it called again? Cleanrefillery.com is how you get to it. I remember John talking where is, about it. Where in Rio Town? I don't know exactly where, um, but like on the main drag, I think, which okay. is pretty pretty small. So it's got to be got to be somewhat easy to find. But I'm, yeah, I'm not sure exactly where. But yeah, it, it finally it opens to the public on Saturday. I mean, they said you can just bring like an old sauerkraut jar and fill it up with shampoo, which I don't know if I'd recommend the sauerkraut 
smell in your head, but. <laughs> All right, this has been super interesting. Lots of resources shared here. Um, any suggestions for our topic next month? Now we had talked about smart commuting, maybe alternative transportation. Um, does anybody have any burning issues that they'd like to, or people, speakers that they would like to suggest for, for next month or a future month? If you do, feel free to email. Um, otherwise, we'll go with plan A. And um, I think the League of Michigan Bicyclists, maybe CATA, might have some spokespeople related to that. Maybe Bill's aware of some, some people on the Transportation Commission. Um, um, I will also invite people to tune in tonight to our Environmental Commission meeting at 7 o'clock if you ha haven't had enough Zoom already for the day. Uh, we have a, a special speaker from uh, SEMCOG, two speakers from SEMCOG that um, Cliff had mentioned. They've done a lot of work with green infrastructure and surrounding communities in the Southeast Michigan. Um, and so they're going to share some of their experiences. That'll be for a half hour at seven o'clock. Any other parting comments, folks? Thank you, Paige, for taking time locally. Yeah, we'll thanks for having me. Hope you'll come back. Um, every Wednesday we do this. It's more open next time. And whatever people bring to the plate, to the table, so to speak. All right, we'll stop Thank recording. You. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Stephen, for helping us be here. He's the guy with the flag who uh, is in the background, just letting us connect. Leroy, you're doing all the hard work on that. I'm actually delivering computers right now. <laughs> That's impressive multitasking there. All right, everybody, have a great week. Thanks.